Hello, this is a summary of an article on Shiite doctrine in the Encyclopedia Iranica, dating from 2005. The author of the article is Muhammad Ali Amir Muezzi. Before I begin, let me say that this is only my summary of someone else's work, so if you have any substantial questions about the article, it is best to take them up with the author directly. The article is available online, so I encourage you to read it for yourself. Obviously, you'll have to refer to the article if you want to look at the author's source material. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, let me highly recommend the Encyclopedia Iranica. It's a superb collection of articles on all aspects of Iranian history and culture, and as I say, is conveniently accessible online. Muhammad Ali Amir Muezzi is Professor of Classical Islamic Theology at the École Pratique des Hortitudes in Paris. He is one of the leading academics studying early 12 er Shiism. He is also a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. His publications largely concern Shi Islam and the history of the Quran. Although most of his work is in French, there are several of his books available in English. Uh, so we have The Divine Guide in the Early Shiism, The Sources of Esotericism in Islam, The Silent Quran and the Speaking Quran, Scriptural Sources of Islam Between History and Fervor, and What is Shi Islam, co-authored with Christian Jambé. In the summary of the first of these books, we read that the Imam, the Divine Guide, is the central point around which Shiite, I'd say Shi, religion turns. The power of Shiism comes from the actions of the Imam. This title is reserved exclusively for the successors of the prophets in their mission. The author shows that from the beginning of Shiite Islam until the 10th century, the Imam was primarily a master of knowledge with supernatural powers, not a jurist theologian. The Imam is the threshold through which God and the creatures communicate. He is thus a cosmic necessity, the key and the centre of the universal economy of the sacred. And this viewpoint, I should say, is very much uh, taken up in the present article. In the summary of the second book, we read, two major events occurred in the early century of Islam that determined its historical and spiritual development in the centuries that followed. The formation of the sacred scriptures, namely the Quran and the Hadith, and the chronic violence that surrounded the succession of the Prophet, manifesting in repression, revolution, massacre, and civil war. This is the first book to evaluate the writings of Islam's major scriptural sources within the context of these bloody, brutal conflicts. And then from the third book, uh, this book provides a broad-based introduction to Shi'i Islam. It examines what the Shi'is believe, how they see themselves, and how they view the world. It includes a thorough examination of doctrine, philosophy, the Shi'i approach to the Quran, and the historical evolution of Shi'ism as a branch of Islam. Too often, and too quickly, the conclusion is drawn that Shiism is a marginal heretical sect fundamentally alien to the deeper truth of the great religion of Islam, thrust by historical accident onto the political stage. Shiism either speaks the truth of Islam, meaning that it is a truth of terror, uh, remember this is in the background of various negative images in the West, or it is entirely foreign to Islam and therefore merits outright rejection, as Islamic fundamentalists and some individuals repeatedly claim. This book intends to explain why such common misunderstandings of Shiism have taken root. As you are probably aware, the Shi branch of Islam comprises a number of separate groups, the most significant being the Zaydis, the Ismailis, and the Twelvers. The present article is concerned only with the latter, so subsequent references here to Shiism will normally refer to the Twelvers. 
now to the article. Amir Mu'ezi begins by discussing the principles of religion, but devotes the main part of his article to what he sees as the central vision and focus of Shiism. An important part of Islamic doctrine is what is referred to as the principles of religion, a term sometimes equated with the Western term theology. Both Sunnis and Shi'is agree that the fundamental tenets of their religion include beliefs in the unity of God, the mission of the prophets, especially that of the prophet Muhammad, and the existence of reward and punishment in the hereafter. Twelvers normally add two additional principles to make a total of five. These principles of the school are firstly belief in divine justice and secondly belief in the sacred nature and mission of the Imams. As Amir Mu'ezi points out, this list is historically rather late. Most of the relevant sources, both in Arabic and Persian, seemingly dating from the 17th and 18th century onwards, although there are earlier sources which lean in this direction. However, other early sources have different lists, including the great 17th century cleric Mullah Mohsen Faiz Kashani, who seemingly added Ak, spiritual intelligence, um, and Elm, initiatory knowledge, to his list. As with any study of a religious movement, we need to be aware that ideas change over time and that to regard present day understandings as not being the products of a particular time and place runs the risk of reductionism. Amir Moezi argues that in reality, Shi doctrine is much more complex than that of the five principles and discusses other principles emphasized by various authors uh, as doctrinal foundations upon which the Articles of Faith and most essential beliefs of Imami, Shi'ism specifically rest. These are essentially structural traits. His summary is based mainly on the earliest corpus of traditions, the Hadith reporting, um, that is traditions going back to the first few centuries of the Hejra, and mostly of Mesopotamian providence, particularly from the city of Kufa. This corpus was primarily put into writing between approximately uh, 250 and 350 of the Hejra, that is AD 864 to 961, by traditionalists belonging to the Iranian schools of Qum and Ray. There are other principles that he mentions but does not discuss. Uh, maybe I'll have a chance to deal with some of these in other videos. Uh, the variability of divine decisions, that is Bada, the preservation of the secret, that is Takia, uh, intercession, and divine grace. Now to get to the heart of his article. For Amir Mu'ezi, the veritable axis, that's his words, around which the entire Shi doctrine revolves, is the figure of the Imam. In crude summary, Shiism is fundamentally an imamology. Thus, from theology to ethics, from Quranic exegesis to canonical law, from cosmology to ritual and to eschatology, all doctrinal aspects and all the chapters of faith are determined and find ultimate meaning by a special conception of the figure of the guide. And then he goes on to discuss what he calls the dual vision of reality between apparent and hidden levels, which I'll discuss in this part of the video. And then secondly, a dualistic vision of the world between good and evil, which I'll uh, discuss in the second part of the video, which I'll, I'll produce separately. So first, the dual vision of reality. Uh, after his focus on the Imam, uh, the author's second key concept is that Shiism developed around a twofold vision of the world. According to this, all reality possesses at least two levels. One is manifest, apparent, and exoteric, that is the Zahir, and the other is non-manifest, inner, secret, esoteric, that is the Batem, hidden beneath the apparent level, 
and able also to consist of other levels still further hidden, the Baten of the Baten. This dialectic of the apparent and the hidden, the exoteric and the esoteric, distinct but nevertheless inter interdependent, constitutes a fundamental omnipresent framework. It is at work in the different spheres of faith. First, in theology, God himself comprises two ontological levels. First, that of his essence. The essence of God is said to be forever inconceivable, unimaginable, above all thought, beyond all knowledge. It can only be described by God through uh, revelations and can only be apprehended by a negative or apophatic theology, that is, a form of theological thinking and religious practice which attempts to approach the divine by negation and only to speak in terms of what may not be said about the perfect goodness that is God. This contracts, contrasts with cataphatic theology which approaches God or the divine by affirmations uh, or positive statements about what God is. This essence of God refers to the hidden esoteric level of God, the level of his absolute abscondity. However, if things were to remain so, no relation would be possible between the Creator and his creatures. Thus God, in his infinite grace, also appears in his own being at another level, that of his names and attributes. He reveals himself and makes himself known. This revealed level, recalling the Deus Revelatus of Christian theology, is no longer God the Unknowable, but God the Unknown, who aspires to be known. It is the esoteric, sorry, it is the exoteric, manifest, revealed level of God that can be known in him. Now the names and attributes act in creation by means of vehicles, divine organs, which are theophanies, locations for the manifestation of God. And here we have the very central word mazhar for manifestation. This brings us back to the figure of the Imam, who in his different dimensions is omnipresent in the world of theophany, acting as a veritable centre of gravity. Thus, in his cosmic dimension, the Imam is the theophany par excellence, the most exalted place of revelation for the divine names, that is, of that which can be known of God. He is archetypal and universal. The cosmic Imam constitutes the revealed aspect of God, his exoteric level, and so knowledge of his reality is tantamount to that which can be known of God. Furthermore, the cosmic Imam possesses both an apparent level and a hidden dimension. His esoteric and unrevealed aspect is his metaphysical aspect. It is cosmic, literally, in the sky, according to one of the oldest sources. But the Imam also has an exoteric and apparent level. This is his place of manifestation, as revealed in the historical Imams of the different cycles in sacred history, a concept closely linked to prophetology. Thus, for Shis, each great prophet, each messenger of God, is accompanied in his mission by one or many Imams. For Adam, the first man and prophet, through Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Solomon, Moses, and Jesus, and others, to Muhammad, the seal of legislative prophethood. Further, these different cycles, each with their great messengers and their imams, are interlinked by an uninterrupted chain of minor prophets, imams, and saints. Altogether, these constitute the great family of the friends of God. They are those who bear and transmit divine friendship, or alliance, walaya, a key term in all Shi doctrine. These are the places of manifestation of the archetypal cosmic Imam, his revealed face. Thus, thanks to a theology of successive cascading theophanies, knowledge of what is knowable in God, the ultimate mystery of being, begins by knowledge of the man, as 
Fatima is concluded, I guess we should add woman of God. In this manner, a theology of theophany take, seeks to avoid both agnosticism, here a theological conception maintaining effective knowledge of God to be impossible, and associationism or assimilationism, a concept that establishes creaturehood as the epistemological basis for knowledge of the divine. What do the friends of God accomplish? They enable the word of God to reach man. At specific moments, this is revealed by the holy books, sacred scriptures, brought by important legislating prophets that the Quran calls those endowed with firm resolution. These revelations possess both an exoteric apparent aspect and an esoteric secret dimension, a letter beneath which a spirit is hidden, to use the Pauline analogy. Although the prophet messenger is surely privy to both levels, his mission consists of presenting the letter of the revelation, that is, its exoteric level, that which has descended to the majority of people to the mass of believers from his community. As just mentioned, each prophet is accompanied in his mission by one or more Imams. In Imami Shi'ism, the friends of God, the Awliya par excellence, are the group of the 14 impeccable ones. That is Muhammad, his daughter Fatima, and the 12 Imams, but other Imams have existed throughout religious history although the sources do not all agree on the names. Those often, sorry, those most often mentioned are Seth as Imam of Adam, Shem as Imam of Noah, Ismail as that of Abraham, Aaron or Joshua for Moses, Simon, John and all the disciples for Jesus, and Ali and his descendants for Muhammad. The mission of the Imams is to teach the spirit of the book, that is, its, ex sorry, its esoteric level, revealing the secret of its origin. But the esoteric nature of what they are teaching means that they do not teach everyone, rather they teach it only to a minority of initiated believers, these constituting the elite of the community. From this perspective, the Shi'is can claim their minority status within the Islamic world to be a sign of privilege. Without initiatory teaching by the Imam, the text of Revelation does not reveal its depths. It is like a barren letter whose spirit remains unknown. This explains why the Quran is called the silent book, whereas the Imam is said to be the eloquent Quran. In this regard, the prophet messenger is said to be the messenger of the exoteric religion, which in Shi vocabulary is called Islam, literally the submission. That is to say, submission to the letter of revelation, thus making the mass of believers Muslim, those who have submitted. But the Imam is the messenger of the esoteric element of revelation the initiator into spiritual religion, concealed beneath the letter, lit technically called Iman, literally faith. The people of faith, the faithful believers, are therefore, according to this technical vocabulary, those initiated into the secrets of religion, the people of spiritual hermeneutics, adepts of the Iman. In a word, she's which is why all religions have had their majority Muslims and their minority Shi'is, a mass of people of the exoteric, the Ahl al-Zahir, unable to fathom depth, and an elite consisting of the people of the esoteric, the Ahl al -Baten, initiated into spiritual levels of the faith. The historical Shi'is, those of historical Islam, thus form the last link in a long initiatory chain that traverses history, going back to Adam and the initiated Shi's of his Imam Seth. There is a further distinction, however, 
between those satisfied with the exoteric aspects of their imam's teaching and those who seek to grasp the secret dimensions of the latter, that is, superficial Shi'is and authentic Shi'is, respectively. Thus, there exist exoteric Shi'is and esoteric Shi'is. Ultimately, the initiatory teaching of the succession of imams is the unveiling of the mysteries of God, the world, and man, that is to say, the secret of secrets in all religions. The terrestrial imams are thus presented as the bearers and transmitters of a secret whose content is precisely the metaphysical imam. Amir Mu'esi provides a chart in which the dual vision of the world is shown by complementary pairs based on the contrast between the manifest and the hidden. Thus, we have the exoteric level, which is concerned with names and attributes connected with prophethood, uh, focusing on the letter of the revelation and leading to submission to exoteric religion and directed to the masses. Uh, then we have the hidden esoteric level uh, focusing on the essence connected to the imam and uh, concerned with spiritual hermeneutics and uh, appealing or leading to initiation into esoteric religion uh, and appealing to the minority, the elite. So many thanks for listening and particular thanks to my patrons Ian Palin and Tricia Williams. If you like these videos you're welcome to subscribe to my channel. I'll try to answer any questions you may have in a future video. Uh, those who want to support the development of the channel can do so through Patreon or PayPal. I'll give details below the video. You can also click the like button so that I can get an idea of which videos are of greatest interest to viewers. Uh, I will continue this, uh, the second part of this video talking about uh, the dualistic vision of the world uh, in a separate uh, video for ease of recording. Thank you. Have a good day.